This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News. I'm Sophie Ikenye. Our top stories. Big dreams and bogus agents. Our BBC investigation reveals the human cost behind the promises of fame and fortune in football. The agent will go out of his way to invest in you, knowing fully well that at the end of the day, he's going to get an in, a return on his investment. Botswana lifts a five-year ban on hunting after a countrywide consultation. Then it means our employment has come, and it means money into our pockets and food to the table. Also in the program, a place of healing. The Ethiopian center helping women rebuild their lives after suffering devastating injury during childbirth. And in sport, the Teranga Lions kick off the FIFA Under-20 World Cup in Poland with high hopes of reaching the finals this time round. Thanks for joining us on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. They are promised fame, fortune and a glittering career. In an investigation for the BBC's GIST Nigeria program, it's been revealed that some young Nigerian footballers are being targeted by fake agents conned into paying their way abroad in the hope of an international career and then left stranded without money or hope. Adjoke Aluhotse has a story. 18-year-old Michael Obuneme is an attacking midfielder. He plays in the local league in Lagos. His desire is to be the next Cristiano Ronaldo. Michael tells me he was recently approached by a football agent who told him he had the talent needed to play in the Indian league. He started approaching me that um, he wants to work with me, that he's a football agent, that he has a deal for me in India. He then asked me that um, the club have watched my video clip that I should send him 350000 that uh, he will use it for the visa and ticket fee. So that was when I approached my manager. The price demanded by the scouts is not unusual. Included in the fee are promises of fame and fortune. But the penalty of pain is too often crushed hopes and broken dreams. Then he changed the, uh, the invitation to Denmark. So we went to the Danish uh, embassy in Abuja. So they told me that um, the invitation was a fake one. Michael was lucky to spot a fake but others were not and found themselves stranded in various parts of the world after falling for the scam. 24-year-old Sheyi says he left Nigeria after an agent assured him of a spot in South Africa. His first stop was Ghana. He didn't make it further from there, despite parting with hundreds of thousands of Naira. We begin on some money be 250,000. I said I, said I can't afford uh, 250,000. But we concluded that we we'll pay 200,000. Before I left in Nigeria, he told me that the process is just two weeks. Then I was telling him that, oh, time is going. If you know you don't have anything, you found my money and let me go back to my country. Then he now brought, he brought up another issue. Like, let me take you to Iran or Sri Lanka. I said, no, that is not, the, that is not what we're back now. Back in Lagos, Sheyi's mother, a widow, tells me it took a family contribution to raise the cash and it's been extremely difficult to get in by since then. That's what that is causing, causing hypertension to me up to now. Because I know that if she get through with that thing, I will not like a good thing. But now, it is now, I'm not still okay. She is now stuck in Accra, Ghana, struggling to make ends meet and too ashamed to return home. Like she, many of the players training at the Indafa Park in Accra are stranded after being conned by men purporting to be football scouts. Stories of young players being conned are rife, but no official statistics exist into the true scale of the problem. Licensed agents are concerned that con men are widening their net trying to capture the unsuspecting and advise that young players check his scout's credentials. When you're good, when an agent sees you, it's like discovering an oil mine or an oil rig or a gold mine. The agent will go out of his way to invest in you knowing fully well that at the end of the day, he's going to get an in, a return on his investment. As the never-ending supply of young and upcoming footballers prove, there is no shortage of skill for the unscrupulous to target. And until tighter rules are introduced and licensing of agents is enforced, 
it feared many more young Nigerians will find themselves relegated to the sidelines. Aduke Uluhotse reporting there. Well, Piers Edwards from BBC Sport Africa is here with me uh, to discuss more on that. You've investigated this kind of stories in the past, Piers. Has anything changed at all? Well, not really, no. The BBC's African department looked at uh, trafficking of, of uh, what, you know, uh, the movement, illegal movement of underage footballers back in 2015 when, when around 24 uh, footballers from Liberia ended up in the Asian country Laos uh, and they were taken there in uh, uh, circumstances that broke numerous FIFA regulations, numerous rules, and then they struggled to come home. They were living in a, a chronic quarters, not getting paid anything, and it was almost tantamount to slavery. Eventually, they did get out of the country, uh, most of them, and a few years later, last year, in fact, uh, FIFA fined the Lao Football Federation nearly a million dollars uh, because they had helped these players go to somewhere they shouldn't have gone. Now, was that a deterrent? Absolutely not. If you look at online articles, we've got numerous cases like that we've just heard of players ending up in far-flung destinations. Some of the players in this piece obviously ended up in Ghana. They can count themselves lucky. There's some ending up in places like Nepal, India, the United States, Europe, sleeping on the streets there. I've heard reports of, uh, of players who've gone to Europe wishing to make it big in football, who've uh, had to beg on the streets for money, and some have even entered into a uh, into the sex trade, I understand, just to make some sort of a living. As we heard in the report, the full scale of this is not known. Uh, repeatedly, we hear that many boys are absolutely ashamed. Their, their families uh, sold valuable possessions to fund their trips to Europe. They get there, they've duped, they feel like they've let the family down when they should be providing them for them instead. Sometimes they don't even tell their families that they're mm -hmm. not playing as a footballer. So, especially since many of them just take one-way tickets to these places, we're never going to know the full extent of it and it's going to keep going on. What about the African football authorities? What part can they play or are they even doing anything at all? Well, it's not just the African football authorities, but it's FIFA too. You know, you, one would argue that football's world governing body should be looking out for this, but mm -hmm. I don't think FIFA has got the capacity, frankly. They would need a separate wing to try and check on all these players and at a non-professional level, FIFA, I'm sure, might argue this is not our responsibility. FIFA certainly didn't help matters. By 2015, they, they scrapped the licensing for agents, which means anybody can be an agent, which means, if anything, the problem has got bigger, not smaller, because I could go and work on an agent on the streets anywhere around the world. I do not have to be licensed by FIFA so, so, to do so it. So then what then should the potential footballers be looking out for? I mean, how can they know this is, this is a scam? Well, they've really got to do their due diligence and they've got to ask some serious questions. They've got to ask the scout or the agent, whoever's talking to them, to provide them with some paperwork, a paper trail to show that there is a club genuinely uh, who wants to talk to them. Uh, they should talk to their local FA to ask if said agent or said scout is a reputable and trustworthy figure. Uh, the FA really should give permission for young footballers to move abroad. And let's not forget the FIFA rules actually prohibit any movement of any footballer um, under the age of 18 to move such a long way away away. So they've just got to check with the local FA and, um, and hope that the FA will know about the agent and can therefore cut this off at source before allowing them to leave the country. All right, Piers Edwards, thank you. Let's now take a quick look at other stories making the headlines across Africa. Votes are being counted in Malawi's general election with incumbent president Peter Mutharika, who's seeking a second and final term in office, so far winning more than 40% of votes cast, with 75% of votes counted. Now, for the first time, the results are being transmitted electronically. Police in Uganda have arrested a 25-year-old British man and two Ugandans accused of taking part in a miracle cure scam. Sam Little and his accomplices are alleged to have given Ugandans a chemical made from the industrial bleach chlorine dioxide, uh, saying it cures diseases like cancer and malaria. Botswana has reintroduced elephant hunting after a five-year suspension in an effort to tackle the increasing problem of conflict with humans. It has 130,000 elephants, more than any other country, and wants to use hunting as a conservation tool to manage the herd and bring in more funding. But the decision has been criticized by some conservationists, as Alistair Lith had reports. There are more elephants in Botswana than any other country on earth, but that comes with its own problems. While poachers kill elephants across Africa, some ask if there are too many of them here. 
Living near elephants means your house can be flattened, your crops destroyed, and even your family members killed. Trying to stop conflict with humans is a big part of Botswana's decision. Our responsibility to conservation has not changed, but our responsibility for our people as well has not changed, and we must make them part of the solution. Hunting is not going to dramatically reduce elephant numbers, but it might push them away from some villages, and it will bring in money. Trackers and their communities who worked with hunters lost their jobs five years ago. During the government consultation, people asked for a return to hunting. It means money into our pockets and food to the table. Because as we speak, these people are very poor. There's nothing, really nothing, completely nothing that they can rely on as a source of income. Critics say luxury tourism has grown since hunting was banned, that rich tourists will be scared off, and that hunting won't stop the conflict between elephants and people. The problem will be that elephants, angry, upset and aggressive because of hunting, will cause even more human wildlife conflict. In Kenya, we don't have any hunting and our elephants are doing fine. And we're calling on the Botswana government to rescind that decision. But Botswana is a big place. Wilderness areas have little attraction for safari goers, but they are perfect for hunting, which, if regulated, can bring in income for conservation. Many conservationists believe opening up any trade will encourage poaching. But it's an election year. Hunting is popular with rural voters. Alistair Leithhead, BBC News, Nairobi. Well, let's bring in Kadu Sabunya. He's the president of the African Wildlife Foundation. He joins us now from Nairobi. Uh, thanks for taking time to talk to us on the program. The general reaction at first glance to Botswana's latest move is that this has really taken uh, the, the country or even the continent really many years back and will encourage poaching. Yes, that, I think that's the, the right reaction to the announcement. But I think we are chasing the wrong ball and uh, we are focusing on the wrong argument. I think as you, you've just recognized in your piece, I think what we need to do from the conservation movement is really to start understanding what are the root causes of why governments are making these decisions and why c communities are accepting and supporting the governments on, on, on this. The underlying issue is poverty. The underlying issue is human wildlife conflict. The underlying issue is the value communities or Africans are putting on wildlife. The other underlying issue is the proper management of protected areas. These are issues that need to be addressed. It's not as simplistic as hunting versus non those who, su who support hunting so or those who don't support hunting. So it is not a yes or, or no uh, situation. But then I wonder whether this is really inevitable, that this will be the future uh, of the continent or even the world, really? Absolutely. And uh, Botswana is a, a good example. They don't have m more than 130 elephants for, 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 for no reason. They've been very, very good at conservation. But as Africa democratizes, as communities are empowered and have a, a political voice, governments are going to increasingly respond to their needs. And I think what we need to do and factor in as part of our conservation efforts to address the economic aspects of those people or governments that are dealing with conservation. The issue here is what are the economic alternatives we are offering to our communities. We've been in this, in this, in this field for more than 180, uh, more than 86 years on the continent, where we have been very effective is where we have improved livelihoods of communities living next to wildlife. You ca communities cannot continue valuing chicken uh -huh. or goats more than wildlife, and we expect it's otherwise. All right. Uh, I'm afraid we have to leave it there, Kadu Sabunya. This is a discussion that will be ongoing, and uh, we hope to have you back on this show again. Thank you for taking time to talk to us on, on Focus on Africa. Thank you. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News. There's still to come. Salim Kikeke will be here with all the sport, including the surprise inclusion of Nabi Keita in Liverpool's squad for their training camp in Mabeya ahead of the Champions League final.
I'm Sophie Ikenye and you're watching Focus on Africa from BBC World News. The top stories on this program, a BBC investigation finds young Nigerian footballers are being targeted by fake agents lured into paying their way into Europe in the hope of an international career. Botswana has lifted a five-year ban on the hunting of elephants and other animals after a countrywide consultation. Now, it's a condition that carries such shame and stigma that it can leave women isolated from their communities. Each year, tens of thousands of women around the world suffer from what is a devastating injury, obstetric fistula. It's preventable and treatable. So why, what exactly is this condition? Well, it's an injury that can happen during childbirth and is caused by prolonged or obstructed labor. The result is a hole between the vagina and the bladder or the rectum or both. Now, each year, up to 100,000 women worldwide are affected by the condition. One center in Ethiopia is working to empower survivors, as Hana Temuaru now reports. Take it away from the battle of city life, there is a place of healing and rehabilitation. Destamander, or village of joy in Amharic, is a lifeline for women like Fatuma Omar. Married at 12 and pregnant at 15, Fatuma isolated herself after developing obstetric fistula during labor. I didn't talk with anyone. I was afraid of what they'd say. I was ashamed that I might smell. I felt like I was just above the dead and below the living. I used to wish I would die. I wanted to drink poison, but I couldn't leave my bed, and my neighbors refused to buy it for me. I then wanted to hang myself. I couldn't fast at Ramadan since I was not clean. I couldn't get close to people. I couldn't pray. For eight years, I lived crying with my mother. Obstetric fistula happen as a result of prolonged and obstructed childbirth. And often, the babies don't make it alive. I went into labor when I was at home. It took two days, but I didn't deliver. So they took me to a hospital. There I had a stillbirth, but I was unconscious, so I didn't know. But through the work of the Stamander Center, women have a renewed hope. <laughs> After different surgeries, they come here and stay for three months for different interventions and mainly counseling. A fistula survivor has been pushed by the community, traumatized and isolated. So this, big inter this is a big intervention in order to help her to, 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 to think uh, into her previous role. And the other is different uh, training, mainly handicrafts. And the handicraft has uh, literacy and numeracy component. Fatuma is excited to face a new chapter of her life after two years of rehabilitation. Now I have hope. The doctors told me I can get married after a year. That's what I aim, to be married again and to have kids after a year. The hope is that as women tell their stories, there will be greater awareness of the condition, reducing the stigma that still devastates so many. Hannah Tamari, BBC News. You're watching BBC Focus on Africa. It's time now for some sport with Salim. Hello, Sophie. Many thanks. Hello, everyone. And uh, straight into football. Uh, the FIFA World Cup Under-20 has kicked off in Poland. The Lions of Taranga, Senegal, has made an excellent start by winning the opening game against Tahiti. They've won the game 3-0. Amadou Sanya scoring a hat-trick there. Senegal were the first African team to qualify for the tournament. This is the third time they are appearing in the Under-20s World Cup and they hope to make it to the final after, failing, after falling short four years ago. In 2015, they reached the semi-finals losing 5-0 to Brazil. They also lost 3-1 in the third place game against Mali. Tahiti are only uh, making their second appearance at a under-20 World Cup. Nigeria, Mali and South Africa are other teams that have qualified from the continent. Now, good news for the national elephants ahead of the Africa Cup of Nations. Guinea international Nabi Keita has been included in Liverpool's squad that has travelled to Spain 
for the UEFA Champions League final. Liverpool's manager Jurgen Klopp wants to keep Keita involved and he will continue his rehabilitation program away from the main squad with the club's fitness coaches this week. The midfielder, who is currently sidelined by a groin injury, travelled with his teammates on Monday. Keita is ahead of schedule after initially being ruled out for at least two months by Klopp after he limped off in the first leg of, leg of the Champions League semi-final against Barcelona three weeks ago. This means he could play a part in the Africa Cup of Nations in Egypt, which begins on July the 19th. <clears throat> And Spanish, uh, Spanish giant Sevilla, who are in Tanzania for a three-day tour, face the newly crowned Tanzanian champions Simba Sports Club in Dar es Salaam today in a thrilling friend friendly game. Simba, who won the Tanzanian league this week, were leading 3-1 by halftime. Sevilla mounted a comeback. However, the game is on its 90th minute. Simba are leading 4-3. In, uh, the, uh, that's the score. The game was played at the National Stadium that was packed with mostly Simba fans who are still celebrating their championship. Sevilla are the first Spanish team to visit this East African nation. The squad included Spanish international and World Cup winner Jesus Navas. The, the, the five-time Europa League winners landed in the commercial capital on Tuesday on the tour which is part of the La Liga World Challenge program. And that is the sport, Sophie. Thank you. Thank you, Salim. I hope this next story does not affect you because I know that you are fluent in Swahili. Yes, that's my mother tongue. <laughs> this is your you mother want, tongue. Do you want me to hand back in Swahili? Yes. Kwako, Sophie. Asante, Salim. <laughs> Now, one of the biggest challenges some African parents in the diaspora face is having conversations with their children in their mother tongue. Most say their children only pick up bits and pieces by listening closely to adults. Well, there are some who want to change that. And here in London, a new Nigerian cultural center has opened with a chance to learn the West African language of Yoruba. Tolu Adeoye went to visit. An introduction to the Yoruba language for toddlers of Nigerian heritage, but it's not just the little ones that are learning in this session. The class is for parents too, one of a number held at this dedicated centre in Peckham. A lot of kids grew up not speaking, their parents didn't teach them Yoruba because they spoke English, especially migration as well, coming to the UK, people just felt it was okay to just, you know, they don't want their kids to speak with a funny accent or Nigerian accent, so they kind of like abandoned teaching their kids their mother tongue. Um, but I think with us second generation, younger generation, we realised that that was a mistake that our parents had made with not teaching us our language and we want to have that connection to our roots. It's fitting that the centre has been opened here in Peckham, which is of course nicknamed Little Lagos. But with over 300 languages spoken across London, it's not just here where there's an interest in keeping languages going across generations. Back at the Culture Tree Centre, Bemi has plans to expand the number of classes to meet the growing demand. The level of interest is not just in London, it's everywhere. It's in Manchester, Birmingham, America. So we do a lot of online Skype lessons as well with people. So what would your tips be for someone like me who can understand Yoruba? My parents spoke it at home, but I've never really been able to speak it myself. I think the problem a lot of people think is if I don't have the pronunciation, then I, don't, I won't speak it because people will laugh at me. But let go of that. Just try and just practice. Practice, 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 and don't be shy to speak, even with an accent. <laughs> Tolu Adeoye, BBC News. Well, before we go, a quick look at our top story today on Focus on Africa, Botswana has lifted a five-year ban on the hunting of elephants and other animals after a nationwide consultation. The country is a sanctuary for around 130,000 elephants. Well, that's all from the program from me and the rest of the team. Thanks for your company. Bye.